All right, great. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, uh, welcome to our panel on building racial equity with the Democratic AGs um, as they are the front lines of our democracy. Um, and so I wanna to welcome to you to the room. My name is Farah Melendez. I am the political director for the Democratic Attorneys General Association. So happy to be back at Netroots with all of you. And of course, with our amazing panel here with our AGs. Uh, so just a few house things as our AGs turn on their cameras, uh, house rules so that way folks know kind of uh, what to do and the process of, of our new digital world is that um, if you do not see or have trouble with closed captioning, please go ahead and log out, come back in. And if it's still not working, just take a look at the bottom of the link uh, of this page of where our, uh, our panel is and there should be a link there. But if not, then just let us know and chat in the room. Um, there is a Q&A function. And so at the end of this panel, we've left around about 10, 15 minutes in this room for us to, to ask or for you guys to ask any questions. And so if you wanna use the function at the bottom for Q&A, that's the best place to do it. And if you see it disappear, it could be because we, we either already asked it or, um, uh, or moved on to the next question. And so uh, happy to, to be here and let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, so, let's see. <clears throat> so we are going to be covering a lot of interesting things. If you haven't told, we have some pretty heavy hitters on our panel today. Uh, wish we were all in Denver with AG Weiser out in Colorado. Uh, but I wanna go ahead and make sure that each of the AGs take a moment and introduce themselves. And we'll start with uh, AG Weiser since we wish we were there in, in the mountains with you. Well, I'm sure my uh, good friend and colleague in California might make a uh, bid for company. I will say though, uh, Colorado is a special place and I am so honored to be the Attorney General here. I spent my life in public service, starting out as a law clerk for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Byron White. We um, are fortunate to live in Colorado where we really work together. And I've been a member of the community here serving on the law faculty at the University of Colorado as the law school dean, <laughs> chairing our innovation council. But I've also spent time in Washington working in the Clinton administration and Justice Department, President Obama and the Justice Department in the White House. And like a lot of people, uh, we've got some big challenges and we need people to step up. And I, I thought it was my time to do so. And just started in 20. Uh, 19 as Attorney General and have been working on these issues we talk about. Excited for the conversation today. Thank you, AG Weiser. I want to stay out west. Um, let's go with AG Becerra. Sarah, thank you very much. And to Phil, uh, Mara, and Keith, uh, my three colleagues, it's, uh, it's great to be with them. Uh, we've been fortunate to work as a team, and uh, that's why we've had such success because we're a team overall. And uh, I've been thrilled to. It's been a, a thrill for me to be able to uh, partake with them. California is a special place. Um, I say that obviously having been born and raised here, but in, in so many ways, I think it, it really does reflect the future of, of this country. And so uh, be, no mistake that uh, if you have a chance to be the top uh, law enforcement officer for the state, you're gonna do everything you can to keep it forward leaning. We've done that. Uh, we've taken on everybody from Donald Trump to every company you can think of and uh, including the, the little the guy who's trying to take away uh, from the little guy so uh, california believes there's a mission that we can all uh, get behind and that is to open doors we're going to do that best we can and uh, for a guy who was the first in his family to have a chance to go to college and uh, and be the first latino to be ag in the state of california we want to keep opening doors so i'm i'm thrilled to be here thanks for having us Thank you so much, A.G. Becerra. And coming from the West, you're an inspiration, so I love it, uh, being also first generation and daughter of immigrants. Uh, so let's go to the Midwest, A.G. Ellison. Well, I just want everybody to know that the presumptive vice presidential a Democratic nominee is a former state attorney general. Yeah. Just, just keep, let's just keep that in mind, you know? Uh, and whenever you see her on that Judiciary Committee, fiercely challenging those witnesses, man. Those are skills she honed doing what we do every day. Hey, my name's Keith Ellison. I uh, was honored to serve with um, uh, eight General Becerra for 12 years in Congress. He was there longer than me, uh, and he was my mentor, still is. Uh, but I just want to say that, you know, our philosophy here is to help people afford their lives and live with dignity and respect. 
And that means that prosperity is something that every American should expect. And it is our job to make sure that they have that chance fighting economic predation, fighting abuse of people's civil and human rights. And I'm just uh, honored to be with you guys. And I've been to Net Roots Nation many times and just want to say that Net Roots Nation is tailor made for online advocacy. And we've been doing it before it was cool, right? So uh, not to be insensitive. I mean, I know that pandemic's not cool, but we've been doing this for a long time. You've been doing this and we're ready for the moment is I guess what I'm trying to say. So thanks and I'm glad to be here. Thank you, AJ Ellison, the original OG out here is what he's saying. So let's start it over to AG Healy. Hey, Farah. Um, great to be with you. Great to be with, with my colleagues. Um, and great to be with Netroots Nation. So I'm here today in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm the Attorney General in Massachusetts. I actually grew up in New Hampshire, but found my way down here for college and ultimately law school um, and never left. Um, but I found my calling and my home in the Attorney General's office when I left big firm practice um, back many years ago and became head of the Civil Rights Division in the office. And I saw what it was like actually to work with Kamala Harris and take on the big banks and predatory lenders. We were the first to file not only a consumer protection suit, but a civil rights suit against those lenders whose practices had you know, such disparate impacts on black, black and brown communities. Um, I later was lead counsel when we brought the challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. We actually sued President Obama. Um, we didn't sue him that often, but we did. And ultimately that, that case went all the way up to the Supreme Court and you know, the law of the land changed forever with marriage equality. And so those were my experiences as a lawyer in the office. And then what led me to run back in 2014, um, I won in, uh, in what ended up being a landslide, even though I was a pretty much unknown candidate, never run for office and was up against political establishment folks. But the thing that got me there and why I love being with you today is because it was all about grassroots, right? It was all about talking to people, working with people, you know, being out there and, and just engaging. And that's what makes you all in this force so powerful, this convening so powerful. And I think if, as we've seen all the norms of democracy and our institutions, you know, attempt to be whittled away, this is how we build. And I don't even talk about rebuilding post COVID uh, or post Floyd. I don't even use that language. I talk about building because I think for the first time in 450 years, we have the opportunity to build in new and different ways and to rid um, uh, ourselves of systemic racism and inequality. We're gonna talk about that today. I could not be more proud um, of the fact that we are state attorneys general and democratic APs. We have been on the front lines, I'd say we, you know, have been uh, really the line in holding the Trump administration accountable um, and trying to stop as much bad unconstitutional stuff from happening as possible. And it was, I think, really heartening for so many of us to see our former colleague, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, take the stage yesterday. So uh, great to be with you. We're the people's lawyers, and it's great to be with, uh, with all the people at Netroots Nation. Thank you, A.G. Healy. So as A.G. Ellison already said it, this is the bench of the party. So you're looking at it and it's really exciting to to see what happened this week with a former Democratic attorney general uh, who can move on and go and do bigger and larger things. And so it really starts here. Uh, so let's let's just jump into it. So lots of topics to cover. I think what's important here and why we love coming to Netroots is uh, to understand the, the variety of issues and the span of topics that AGs really can cover and do in their states, uh, not only individually, but as a coalition. So following the recent political movements and demonstrations in communities across America, DAGA and our Democratic Attorneys General are taking actions to address the rising concerns of policing in communities of color by proposing police and criminal justice reform discussing racial inequity and speaking with community leaders. Attorneys generals are the people's lawyer in their states and our democratic AGs are reflecting this diversity themselves. So today we have 25 democratic AGs in the country who represent the most diverse group of AGs in history. That includes five black AGs, six women AGs, two Asian Americans, two Latinos, two LGBTQs, one Muslim and one Sikh. 
diverse. Uh, so this diversity helps Democratic AGs as they address current events and protect vulnerable communities within each state. So let's dive into some of these issues to find out what Democratic AGs are doing as the people's lawyer, as we like to call it. So let's start with AG Wiser, since we all wish we were there in Colorado right now and being able to travel. Um, so the title of this panel is Building Racial Equity, Democratic AGs on, um, on the Front Lines. So how are AGs on the front lines during this time when so many communities of color are feeling marginalized and threatened? What are some steps you're taking in your role as AG of Colorado? Sarah, thank you for that lead in and, and my colleagues and I are part of a team and I'm honored to serve with them and I learned from all of them. I wanna emphasize all of us were focused on these issues before George Floyd. What we are now in a moment, an opportunity, I like what Maura said, to build, to build towards justice. I'll take three different cuts at the answer. First and foremost, we need to build an office in Colorado that looks like the people of Colorado, which means we need a diverse and inclusive team at the Attorney General's office. I set up for the first time a position, Deputy Attorney General for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We're committed to hiring, mentoring, supporting a diverse talent pool, not just be lawyers in our office, but become judges and leaders in our state. Last several criminal prosecutors I've hired in our office, all people of color, we need to do our part to build a more diverse and inclusive, not just team at the Attorney General's office, but in the legal profession and leadership more generally. Number two, criminal justice reform. When we see our criminal justice system and a level of incarceration, mostly people of color, we have to see an opportunity to do better. And that goes across the spectrum from ending cash bail, which is a big reason why a lot of people are in jail because they can't afford bail. That is wrong. It doesn't support public <clears throat> safety. It's unfair. We've got to fix it. We've got some uh, great pilot programs here. We want to learn from California. It's done on a statewide basis. We're going to keep fighting for that. Number two, we got to do better on reentry so people don't just leave prison and end up back in prison. We've got to end the school to prison pipeline, which is a lot of times you're getting people, even as teenagers, finding themselves with criminal records on a bad path. We're working on all those fronts. And finally, police accountability and reform. I'm proud of the law that we passed in Colorado. It's a national model. I'm happy to work with other states because we need to build trust in law enforcement, make sure that we've trained law enforcement so that we de-escalate situations and we don't have tragedies like we saw with George Floyd. We've got a lot of work to do. I'm proud of the work we're doing here in Colorado and proud to be colleagues with the great AGs we've got here on this panel. No, that's great. I'm glad that you brought up cash bail system. Um, you, you even testified as to how the cash bail system is fundamentally flawed on many different levels. So can you share your thoughts a little bit more on the inequities of cash bail system? Um, what are the far reaching consequences of a cash bail system, both for the individual and the society at large? And so how can we address these inequities and overhaul the system? What I want people to understand, and this is super important, is this has been studied. When you keep someone in jail, let's say 48, 72 hours, the chances that they commit a crime later go up because when you separate someone from their families, they lose their job, that's a destabilizing event in their lives. The goal of pretrial detention should only be to protect public safety. And that only happens when someone's actually a risk to society. If someone's not a risk, you wanna let them out of jail as soon as possible and you shouldn't be charging them. We have too many fees that are getting built into our system that is hurting poor people who can't pay them, keeping them in jail, or in some cases, taking away their driver's license. We have to take down these barriers. We have to ask ourselves, are what we're doing here really about public safety, or it's because it's always been this way and we don't have the courage and ability to change it. Cash bail is crying out for reform. It doesn't serve public safety, it doesn't help people, and it costs money. So what California's done on this, it is a model um, we're going to fight hard to get it done here in Colorado. No, that's great. And uh, by the way, I see lots of questions in the chat and shout outs from people who are in states where like New York and we have some folks from LA over here. And I saw someone uh, say they're from Denver. So they're giving all of you guys shout outs right now um, and giving you lots of love. But 
I uh, completely agree with you there, AG. And if you can't, like, there's so many barriers and being a leader and showing up, I think is part of the most, what's important here. And so AG Ellison, with everything going on right now, uh, we want to talk about George Floyd. So what happened in what happened to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and too many others are most painful examples of how far we still need to go as a country. But we have, have um, uh, as a country learned from the, or what have we as a country learned from these painful incidences and how can we protect and support our black communities? What can AGs like yourself do to address that hurt and pain and express across the country? So we'll start with you, AG Ellison. Well, let me just start by saying that the Attorney General's office can convene. No matter what happens, no matter what your jurisdiction may be, you can pull people together and you can use your bully pulpit to shine a light on things that Phil just mentioned, like cash bail or juvenile detention, domestic violence. There's a range of things as Attorney General you can do, including uh, this issue of police accountability. My office joined up to um, pull together this document, and this is our working group on deadly and on uh, police involved deadly force encounters, which we did in 2019. As Phil said, and as everybody on the panel said, we didn't just start working on this issue, we've been working on this. And so we've been trying to deal with the issue of police accountability, police brutality all along. We engage law enforcement and community to have a real conversation. We came up with a number of recommendations, several of which were just passed in the last legislative session. Now, I say this to the folks out there listening because you, where you're from, need to engage your attorney general to inconvene people around police accountability. The second thing we can do is we can bring many of us, because jurisdictions are not all the same, but many of us can bring pattern and practice lawsuits, civil claims, where we might be able to say, look, you have a police department which fines all the black folks, which gives them exorbitant fines, just like if you remember the U.S. Attorney, the U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, when did this investigation regarding Ferguson and found out that there was this oppressive system in place. Uh, you know, State Attorney General, some of us have the same kind of authority. We can do that where we have the jurisdiction to do so. We can prosecute. Right now, I'm prosecuting um, a, a group of police officers. I can't go into the case. That I don't want to impact the jury pool, so I'm not going to talk about it. But I will say we do have the jurisdiction in certain situations, which vary from state to state, to prosecute people who violate the law, even if they are police officers. And we should do so. We should not say that we're not, we're going to let some people be above the law and let others be beneath the law. Uh, that this is critically important to prosecute violations of law, no matter who it is. Uh, and then we can advocate legislatively. Very impressed with the work that Phil has done, uh, that, 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 yeah, that Javier and those guys in California have done on use of force, and that Mora have done. And by the way, the four of us are just a slice of the talent that Democratic AGs have. We're just four out of 25. Everybody's doing awesome things. But we can advocate legislatively. And Nevada, you know, Aaron Ford is doing great stuff. Kwame uh, in, in Illinois and Tish James in New York, right out on the front forefront on these issues. Even federally, we have weighed in as a group, uh, and Mora was leading on that effort, weighed in as a group to say that, look, this is what police accountability really looks like. And so those are just a few ideas. But my thing to the Netroots Nation is, you need to look at your state AG as a source of movement, as a source of change. Engage them, call them, get them on the phone, get in the room, get on a Zoom, and give your ideas on what you expect and would like to see them do. So I'll hand it over, but those are just a few ideas. No, that, I mean, that's great. You talked about the movement right now. It means something. You should be talking and communicating with your AG. And so, you know what, why don't we throw this over to uh, AG Becerra. So uh, why is the role of the AG so critical for these issues? Sure, the attorney general in most states is the only uh, law enforcement official, the only uh, people's lawyer that covers not just a city, not just a county, but the entire state. So when the people are looking for protection and defense, uh, the one 
office that can do that for everyone and not just for folks in a city or county is the attorney general. And so it's critical that we're involved. And that's why it's so important that we have statewide policies that let us get into these issues. And I think the, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, the accountability is so important. The transparency, more and more so we're realizing we need to have transparency, transparency in policing and the way public safety is conducted. And, and I would say that the, what I have found in terms of reform, you really can't have reform unless you go down to the roots of the way policing is done. And that's where what Keith said is so important. Uh, in California, we do pattern and practice investigations. Uh, in 20. 18, we did a pattern and practice investigation. Not, a, excuse me, not a, we didn't, we were lucky. We were invited by the chief of police in Sacramento to review a shooting that had occurred, a young man named Stefan Clark in 2018. Uh, we didn't have to go in and do a pattern and practice, which is a more uh, independent activity because we were invited by the new, he was a new chief of police, first African-American chief of police in Sacramento. And what we did, was we, we did a wholesale review of the Sacramento Police Department. We also, by the way, we're asked to do an independent investigation on the criminality of the shooting uh, on top of that, two separate activities. But what I think Keith mentioned, which is so important is, rather than just look at one incident and try to get to the bottom and the truth and the justice to it, you need to do a wholesale review and you gotta start down at the roots. And so we came out with a report, which was directed at Sacramento City Police Department, but it actually ended up becoming the, the basis of law uh, uh, legislation in California, which is now law, which requires uh, every police department to undertake new reforms. And those are starting to take, take form. And we are engaged in a pattern and practice investigation right now of the Bakersfield and, uh, Police Department and the Kern County uh, Sheriff's Department. We are right now in charge of the uh, reform oversight for the San Francisco Police Department. We just got involved in doing the same thing for the small town of Vallejo, which is just north of San Francisco, which has had a number of police shootings. But really the fruits of much of our work came from a lot of what we found out in Sacramento. And it's informed much of what we've done. We have a law in California that allows us to track every single stop by a law enforcement officer. So we can find out if they're profiling by race, or by a transgender status. And so that data now informs us. So it's no longer anecdotal evidence. It's now empirical evidence that will drive our policies. So you do have to get down to the roots to make this happen. And that's where being a statewide official and an office that is there to protect the people statewide, it helps to have AGs involved. Yeah, absolutely. It not only helps to have AGs involved, but a Democratic AG, which is why we'll talk about elections later in this conversation, but it voting for and electing Democratic AGs. If you care about these issues, you should be electing Democratic AGs. Uh, and so AG Healy, I want to make sure we get to you as well um, with, you know, what, what is your perspective on this and how can AGs address it, at least in, in the state of Massachusetts? Well, you know, I, I guess I come to this as somebody who was formerly head of the Civil Rights Division and also now the Attorney General, Chief Law Enforcement Officer for our state. And I think that what my colleagues said is so right on. It's about training. It's about training on, on unconscious bias and better policing practices. It's about officer standards and trainings for, you know, use of force, de-escalation. All that's really important. Um, here in Massachusetts, we've worked to do that. We currently are working on new legislation that will statewide ban the use of chokeholds, create duties to intervene when an officer sees another officer using excessive force, um, encouraging law enforcement's use of, of body-worn cameras and the like. But all of that, it seems to me, um, doesn't get you where you need to go unless there's true accountability. And that's one thing that we have partnered with our chiefs on. Uh, because the ability to identify those who engage in bad actions then hold them accountable becomes very important. And I think that's something that we as, as Democratic AGs have been supporting. We've also, though, Farah, been supporting um, efforts to make sure that our resources are being used appropriately. We have been on the front lines as AGs, for example, fighting the opioid crisis, right? And going after you know major pharmaceutical companies for their abuses, which has translated to a lot of drug activity um, on the streets. And you know, one of the things that we see is that, unfortunately, we've got uh, police who may be trained, many of them sometimes coming from uh, battlefields overseas, 
maybe who haven't been given the training around how to deal with substance use disorder, how to deal with mental health issues and the like. So let's make sure that we not only demilitarize our police, you know, take away some of the unnecessary gear that, you know, studies show just are not conducive and helpful to public safety, but let's also make sure that we are supplying, whether through police departments or through realigning resources within municipalities, the right kind of resources on the street to meet both the public health needs of our residents, but also public safety. Bottom line, a lot of conversations, you gotta bring a lot of stakeholders to the table, um, but you know, you gotta find the points of commonality. And I think it's clear in this moment, in this time, we as chief law enforcement officers have every obligation to act and to rid the system of the systemic disparities that we've seen. Yeah, so I do, I do wanna stay on that topic for a little bit now that you mentioned it, but uh, how AGs affect change. And so whether through lawsuits or through the legislative process or through a policy platform. So for example, AG Healy, your office created a hate crimes hotline dedicated to receiving reports on crimes that are directed towards race, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities. And so uh, how has this, uh, how has this affected and impacted those communities directly that you've been able to see uh, by enforcing and putting these or implementing these in your office? Yeah, I think this step is, it, I mean, this is one of the great things about being an attorney general. You can really act in a, in a number of different ways. You can bring cases and do investigations. You can issue reports. You can, as you say, propose legislation mm -hmm. and policy. Keith mentioned convening, I believe. So, we set up a hate crimes hotline immediately after Trump's election because we saw the rise in, in hate crimes and uh, reports of, of hateful activity. And then we, we recently uh, uh, were out there again because as his rhetoric has continued, more and more people have been marginalized and hurt. Um, we wanted to be very sure after, after George Floyd's murder that people, the public had a place to go. I think it's been well received. I think it's important um, not only so that we are able to take in reports from the public, make sure that those reports are uh, followed up on and addressed, but I think it's important that as a government agency, we send that message to the public that that kind of stuff isn't gonna be tolerated, you know, and we're not gonna allow for it. And here's a hotline, call it out. If you see it, you know, say something, call it out. And I think that kind of messaging mm -hmm is, you know, from a mantle like ours, I think becomes really important. I've seen how important it's become in another context when it comes to the treatment, mistreatment, abuse, um, denigration by the Trump administration of our immigrant communities, right? And I think many of us separately work within our offices to set up, for example, regular councils that meet. I have one on race and equity with stakeholder members of, of, of black and brown communities um, regularly come into my office to engage with me and my team on issues. Same um, uh, with immigrant communities, same with uh, labor and, and you know, uh, members of the disability community. So, you know, I think that kind of engagement is really important and something that's possible through an office like ours. Oh, exactly. And really, how, while powers vary from state to state as well, um, I want to talk to you, A.G. Becerra, on, uh, so your, your office has recommended Nine use of uh, nine use of force reforms and called out on state law enforcement agencies to develop policies in line with the needs of the community. So, how are you specifically working with state legislators and policymakers to affect positive change? Right now, the legislature is working on a number of reforms to our laws. Uh, for example, we're moving towards trying to decertify officers uh, who have engaged in criminal activity or activity that is contrary to their policies. Uh, we're also looking at how we deal with the investigation of use of force by an officer that leads to the death of, of an individual. Uh, a number of policies don't need a law, a state legislative uh, bill to become uh, enacted. And so we're working, I've worked with the chiefs and the sheriffs uh, in California to try to implement policy. We put out a platform of reform uh, over a month ago that really, as I said, built on much of we, what we had put out back in 2018 uh, on the 
uh, Sacramento incident that we investigated. But what we're trying to do is get uh, agencies to use best practices. Everyone understands that you can avoid a lot of these shootings if you de use de-escalation tactics that have been proven successful. Uh, we understand that uh, it is dangerous, not just you to use a chokehold, but we are calling, we've got a reform that calls for agencies to stop using any type of hold that re constricts or restrains the flow of blood or oxygen uh, to an individual. And so you can go further, even, even simple stuff, use of canine. Right now, the policy on canine can be almost anything, which includes using them as weapons. We're talking, we believe a canine should be used not as a weapon, but as a as a means to deter the escape of an individual and to be able to detain them, not to use the canine as a weapon. So very simple things to very expansive things. But what we do know is that there are practices out there that we can use to help us move towards safe policing where we become a partner with the community and not just perceived as agents who go after criminals. No, and you know, I want, I'm glad that we are all actually saying the names of those who, who unfortunately um, have lost their lives. So let's continue to say their names out loud um, because they're not said often enough. But to all of you, um, and we can start with A.G. Weiser, but there's a lot of discussion about race when it comes to policing in America, but racial inequality appears in almost all facets of daily life. Uh, can you talk about other areas you're focusing on to improve racial equality? Let me mention three areas, and I want to start with one that's particularly painful during this pandemic, which is the digital divide. Um, we hear about this. It affects both rural Americans as well as those in inner cities. And it's something I've worked on for coming up on 20 years now. Think about the following. School is not in person. Rich white people generally could be putting their kids in a pod and hiring private tutors. But poor people of color may not even have access to the online education that the school district is offering. That disparity threatens to exacerbate existing disparities. In the world I want to live in, we all send our kids, no matter whether you're rich, poor, black, white, to schools that are good schools for everyone. That's the America that I believe in. Unfortunately, that's not the America that we're all living in right now. And one of the issues we need to address desperately is access to both broadband and devices so you can participate in the modern digital economy, which is more important now than ever, which is why 39 state AGs, I was able to lead a coalition, have said, Congress, you got to respond right now to this pandemic. And one of the responses, support for broadband access. Number two, healthcare disparities. We're seeing this with the pandemic. And it's not new. If you're an African-American woman and you're giving birth to a child, the chances are far more likely you die in childbirth. What's going on there? It's a cry for help. Addressing issues that come up in criminal justice, implicit bias, unconscious bias, but comes up in other areas too. And third, as I mentioned, the school to prison pipeline means in the educational system, depending on your skin color, you're more likely to be suspended, expelled, or have criminal citations against you. All of this work calls out for engagement. It calls out for creative strategies because we've got to do better. And right now we're living in a moment where the commitment and support towards racial justice is at a level that before he passed, John Lewis noted, gave him real hope. And so we've got to go ahead and do what we can on all fronts because it's not only about criminal justice, it's about healthcare, it's about access to broadband and education. And we've got to work on all those fronts. Uh, well, you mentioned the pandemic, and of course, we're going to talk about that in just a second, but I do want to make sure, um, A.G. Ellison, you are a champion on these issues as well. Uh, you have been for so long, and uh, so can you also talk about areas that you've been focusing on to improve racial equity? Yeah, there, first of all, every issue has racial equity. There's no issue where racial equity is not a thing. It's mm -hmm. in every single thing that we do. I will just sort of subjectively pluck out two because I think that they need a little focus. Housing. Look, as attorneys general, our bread and butter is consumer protection. Tenants are consumers. And so are people who buy homes and buy loans and mortgages. And right now, this is particularly uh, critical because unemployment is at depression levels. 
people are being laid off and unemployed, uh, literally over a million filings for unemployment, and that translates directly into rent, mortgage payments, and things like that. Now, the CARES Act was beneficial in that if you had a federally subsidized uh, rent or mortgage payment in some way, you could be, uh, you could, there was a moratorium on eviction foreclosure. That, when that runs out, there's going to be a wave and we need to be ready to respond to it. And I want to commend nearly all of our states, give uh, Josh Shapiro a lot of credit, who I think helped spearhead this. Now, he wasn't the only one, but he was there, uh, who got all the other non CARES Act lenders to say, CARES Act. Uh, um, loans and rent have been for uh, or bought, have been stopped or or moratorium on those. What about the rest? In Minnesota, we got uh, over 30 uh, lenders together to say we will false forestall, we will forbear on foreclosure because we fear that this wave of foreclosure and eviction is right in front of us, which would set off a lot of problems. Not not only that people will be out of home, but that then big monopolistic companies like Invitation Homes get to swoop into the neighborhood and buy up all these residential properties, which creates another problem of monopoly. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that monopoly and highly concentrated markets have serious racial implications. If monopolies make it hard for small businesses to thrive. Think about how monopolies make it hard for black, brown, and women-owned businesses to thrive. If white-owned small businesses got a tough time, the other ones got an over enormous barrier. Imagine, Lake Street in Minneapolis is a, is a part of our town where a lot of folks immigrated from Mexico and they really revitalized that street. You can go to Lake Street, and you can get wonderful food, wonderful everything, all with a Latin American flavor right there in Minneapolis. And yet, uh, those folks can get pushed out by some chain that you know masquerades as offering uh, Latin American food there. But as they as they you know get bigger and they get larger and they squeeze out the competition, those small business people are being pushed out. And that is a racial inequity right there. So I just want to mention housing, and I also want to mention monopoly, because I believe, Net Roots Nation, that we have not paid enough attention to monopoly, oligopoly, and antitrust. It is the root of so many problems in our society. And uh, one person who ran for attorney general in New York just released a book uh, called Break Em Up. Her name is uh, Zephyr Teachout. And I would commend people to read her book because. Uh, we as AGs have antitrust authority. All of us do antitrust cases, and it is a fertile ground for social justice for those of you who want to delve into that. So those are just two things, and I could have mentioned 25 more. Uh, all I want to say is amen. Um, thank you, though, for making sure that, you know, people of color, we don't care about two issues. We care about all the issues. And so, um, but AG Healy, I want to, I want to make sure we give time to you and then also to Becerra and then we will jump into COVID and, and the pandemic and how it's affecting the communities. But AG Healy, uh, what other areas are you focusing on to improve racial equity? You know, everything. I mean, um, I, I basically charged my office, every single division, whether you're working in utilities and doing telecommunications or consumer work or worker safety, civil rights, um, everybody's got to see their work with an equity lens. So if we as an agency are going to defend a permit that has been made to a company that's going to cite something nasty in an environmental justice community, that's going to further exacerbate you know, poor health comes for black and brown uh, communities. We're going to look at that through an equity lens and deciding, you know, how we support or not support that. Um, whether we defend challenges to, to the way our education is funded when we see real disparities, uh, racial disparities in Massachusetts, which leads the nation in education. However, we've got serious disparities that exist within our state. So I think having that mindset, having that mentality that after 450 years of systemic uh, racism that has bled across every sector from transportation, employment, education, housing, of course, 
uh, health. This is now the opportunity, if we have the mindset and the consciousness there um, and, and the intentionality around it, I do think we have an opportunity to really build our way through and out of some of these disparities. And, you know, my colleagues and their teams do it every single day. And, um, and you know, a lot of what we see is, is economic justice. But as you know, you know, whether we're talking about climate justice or economic justice, it is communities, black and brown communities that are disproportionately hurt, first and worst, by some of the practices that, um, that my colleagues are, are talking about. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I'm on mute, but the whole time I'm saying mm -hmm, um, <laughs> to everything and agreeing with you. But um, A.G. Becerra. Oh, you're on mute. It's not user error. You're fine. <laughs> I apologize. Let me first say I associate myself with everything my colleagues have said. So let me just point to a couple of things. Um, you know, it's, as we try to do these reforms, we have to remember, as I said, it's really, I believe it's going to the root. So recently we took an action in Stockton, California, a smaller town uh, just south of Sacramento. We had gotten reports that students, mostly of color, uh, were being treated too quickly by law enforcement in school. And, you know, we all, we all hear about this and there's, there's a lot of complaint about the school to prison pipeline. But when you start seeing kids being addressed, not by teachers, not by a, a counselor, but by police, you know what the next step is going to be. And so we went in to take a look at the practices of the Stockton Unified School District using their police. And we found very disturbing things. We were able to reach an agreement rather than take them to court. So now they are reforming the way they handle issues involving some of their students. So rather than direct them quickly to uh, the youth authority, they will now try to address these things in school so these kids stay in school and get the teaching that they need. Another quick example. It, it was 50 years ago that we had the last desegregation case in the state of California until last year when we took on the uh, South Salido Marin County School District uh, if anyone knows California and you know Marin County, it's a very wealthy suburb area of San Francisco. We found a school, a school district that was essentially segregating mostly black kids, black and Latino kids, but mostly black kids into one school as opposed to the school where most of the white kids were being sent. And so we took an action. And again, we were able to get a consent decree, didn't have to go all the way through the court action. And we're going to integrate those schools so that there isn't one school for the minority kids and one school for the white kids. But 50 years after the last desegregation case, we're still having to deal with that. That's because at the root of things, the systems are not equal. They're not just. And so you got to go down to the basics. And so I, if I could close with one last thing on what Keith said, because I think it's so important. So much of this stuff happens because power is consolidated in such few hands. And so when he talks about antitrust, I'm trying to get a, a bill passed to our legislature that lets us review the consolidation in the healthcare market, because more and more big hospitals, and actually now more and more, Wall Street hedge funds and private equity firms are buying up mid-sized community hospitals, clinics, and they're gobbling up, they're predators and they're getting so big. And so we're trying to have a bill passed that would give the, the Department of Justice the authority to review cases of consolidation to make sure it's not just profitable for the, the, for the predator, but there's a value that goes to the community. And it's a tough sell because I got, you can imagine who's against the bill, but we're gonna do that because that's the way you go to the root of the problem. No, I agree. And we've, we've said Sarah, it a few I, times I here, but one quick second. Oh, absolutely. Sorry. I just want to say, Javier, thank you for talking about that Sausalito case. Look, you know, California is a Western state and people normally associate segregation with Southern states, maybe some Midwestern ones. But I just put in the chat this thing by this guy failing, keep California white. I mean, they have a history out there of intense racism, man. And so it's important to understand that this fight for to desegregate America is a nationwide problem and Western and Northern states are just as in need of AGs to fight for equal opportunity as anywhere else. And so uh, Javier, thank you for fighting that case. Uh, and I just, I just want to remind people, this is a nationwide problem and thank you for leading it in California. Sorry to break in, 
just felt the need to mention that. No, that's all right. Feel free to for any AGs to jump in and, and add to it. But uh, I mean, with racial equity, we're talking about getting to the root of the problem. Desegregation didn't end. We're still dealing with it now. If the protests aren't loud enough, thankfully, we have Democratic AGs working on the front lines to help uh, one thing at a time to help the little guy. Uh, but we are amid a pandemic and there's a lots of tragedies and lots of job losses and, and things that we've already mentioned here and losses especially with the minority communities but um, as families and communities across the country grapple with how to protect people and preserve civil liberties during the COVID area or era uh, democratic ages are playing a central role democratic ages are successfully defending state executive orders, protecting millions from scams and fraudsters and advocating for our most vulnerable communities. So for example, AG Weiser has led a bipartisan effort to urge Congress to fund expanded access to the internet, like we've mentioned, for telemedicine and online schooling, AG Ellison, and the governor of Minnesota were able to negotiate mortgage relief options with financial institutions for those impacted financially by COVID-19. So could each of you share some ways you have used your office to help those suffering during this historic health pandemic, which is in a stark contrast to the White House's inability um, to think they're above the law and to protect our country. And so, um, A.G. Becerra, we'll start with you. Sure, Farah. We, one of the things we started off very early with was we started to put out an alert to all consumers to watch out for these price gouging scams that were out there. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we have a law in California that says that you cannot raise the price of a product more than 10% uh, from before the emergency uh, was declared by our governor. And so we, we've all seen the stories, right? About how people were trying to sell uh, sanitizer or masks for outrageous prices. And so uh, we acted very quickly and we've prosecuted along with working with our district attorney, local district attorneys, some of those cases. We've also gone, gone after sham charities because it's, it's, it's sad to say, but there are people who will try to profit off of people's despair by establishing these sham charities that really don't do anything but uh, give money to those who pocket it and don't do anything for the cause that they declare. And so we're trying to give people guidance on what to do to know whether the charity that's out there soliciting for dollars for this COVID-19 uh, uh, difficulty are, are real. And beyond that, what we've done is dozens of times now, I, I, it's over 60, we've had to defend our governor's emergency declarations uh, that try to limit activity that could lead to the con contraction of COVID-19 by our population. So uh, we're, we're for, very fortunate we've been successful in court in defending those actions against all sorts of attacks. Uh, and it's all because at the end of the day, we're trying to protect Californians. And so fortunately, uh, the courts have recognized the critical uh, necessity of making sure that the public is protected. And as the AG, our role is to make sure that we're looking first and foremost at that. Beyond that, I, I got to tell you that, uh, as Keith mentioned, the issue of housing, making sure people don't get kicked out of their home or their uh, uh, rental is crucial. We're trying to work as much as we can with our uh, sister agencies on that. Student loans. I mean, we could get we could get no assistance from the federal government. And every one of us on this uh, chat uh, was part of an effort to make sure that we got Secretary DeVos at the Department of Education to recognize that students right now can't find jobs. Uh, it's going to be tough for them to pay their loans. Why the heck are you letting these predatory lenders and these uh, uh, loan servicing agencies go after these folks as if they were criminals. And so we've been out there trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so everywhere where we can step in, we've tried to do that. We all of us were urging, uh, uh, calling on Amazon and Whole Foods to pay their workers properly and treat them properly. Uh, we know what that's about. So it goes on and on. We work in tandem in most cases with our governors, but some of the issues we can take on independently as AGs. Oh, 
great. I, I'm sorry, my screen froze for just a second. Um, but I also saw somebody in the chat mention that they saw Lysol for $95, which is bananas. <laughs> so uh, thank you, A.G. Becerra, for, for keeping a watch on all the Californians. I saw A.G. Weiser fiercely writing some notes down as the former professor that he is. Um, and so A.G. Weiser, let's go to you. Thank you. Uh, I'll start with uh, Javier's point and make a uh, sort of public service announcement. My view on these COVID-19 scams and other scams is the Mad-Eye Moody rule. For those hands, fans of Harry Potter, Mad-Eye Moody was known for preaching constant vigilance. Here's an example. We just had one come up pretending to be the Boulder County Public Health Department saying they were doing contact tracing and they just needed your, wait for it, credit card number so they could process a test. They are preying on people being trusting. And so I sort of hate to deliver this message, but it's important, constant vigilance. The scammers out there look at fear as an opportunity. And we've had to do the same sort of things Javier has, go after those with a range of scams. This is the latest one, stay nervous, stay vigilant. Um, I also want to come back to broadband for a minute, which is we're working on some solutions. Uh, it's a really important area. We need to be in this together. And something I've seen in Colorado, it's a great spirit. Communities pulling together. One is there are actually people giving up their refund checks to support others who are businesses who are struggling. And one thing we set up is a effort to get lawyers, and, and I just take Keith's point very seriously, the power to convene. It's a formidable ability. We've done it among lawyers to support small businesses, particularly minority and women-owned businesses on a range of issues. Because what I am terrified about in this moment is so many small businesses will go under and never come back because they don't have the sophistication to ask for grace, if you will, on their rent payments. When you as a lawyer become an advocate for these businesses, that opens up doors and opportunities. So we're getting the word out in our office about this program. We're getting lawyers engaged. We're getting the word to small businesses to stand up for them. Also, again, Javier raised this point, something that as a former professor, I'm really passionate about, protecting students with debt. And we worked out with the uh, non-federal backed uh, student lending, a similar regime, a grace period, just like the CARES Act did. This is really important so that students who don't have jobs necessarily aren't being squeezed and subject to all sorts of bad tactics by those loan servicers. And we've got now a student loan ombuds person in our office to protect those students with loans. This is important work that's personal to me. Yeah, and um, I mean, to, to the Netroots audience, I wanna make sure that we just really, that you're listening in on how reachable and how often you can actually just contact your attorney general because they are they're watching your back when it comes to predatory loans and small businesses and so there really is a, a transparency that our dem ags have done such a great job at and it's really i'm really proud to be working with them because they uh, there is a, a level of communication there that i think the public is either not aware of or doesn't know that they can actually just contact the office for for these types of uh, things that are happening. And so um, AG Healy, though, I wanna, wanna make sure we talk about what's going on there in, uh, in Massachusetts. Well, um, you know, a lot of what uh, my colleagues just talked about, we see too here in Massachusetts, and I really applaud all the actions out of their offices. Um, I guess I wanna focus on a few things that we did. So the reason why Democratic AGs are important is because we're the people's lawyers. And we actually are hearing from and engaged with the public directly. In fact, I have a whole community engagement division that I set up when I got elected in 2014. And I am really glad I did because when COVID hit, we could immediately be out in the communities with multilingual paper leaflets, you know, to hand out, to say, hey, there's an eviction and foreclosure moratorium in place. If your landlord tries to throw you out, call this number. You know, we were able to provide real-time information about where to go to get testing. Um, I remember being in a food pantry line and literally hearing from a man who'd been threatened with eviction that morning by his landlord, the locks are gonna be changed. And we were immediately able to get out and get after it. And I think that's the mentality and approach of a lot of our offices. We're very close to the people. Um, the other thing is that we've worked a lot on worker safety. 
you know, because of course, disproportionately, the essential workers who are driving the buses, cleaning the hospitals, you know, delivering the food, working in the distribution centers, uh, serving as personal care assistants, disproportionately black and brown, right? And so those hit hardest were also, um, uh, you know, by, by, by what we've seen in terms of, of coronavirus rates, are also the ones who've had to be out there. And so worker safety has been key for me. We've made it a priority. We've taken on the Amazons and the Whole Foods and the grocery stores demanding worker safety. We set up a hotline. I think that vigilance needs to continue as we fought really tooth and nail to get PPE in place for these workers. And the third thing I'd say is telehealth. You know, sometimes with a crisis, you're able to, to um, you know, you talk about disruptive technologies and the like and chances for leapfrogging. Through this, actually, we've made a lot of gains in telehealth, which I think has made the delivery of healthcare, provided you can accommodate, as Phil points out, the real broadband issues and disparities that, you know, that exist. It's a way to deliver service better to people um, more easily. No, exactly. So those are some of the things. If only we could all just be standing in line next to you to help us solve our problems. That is, that is for sure. <laughs> um, and so, A.G. Ellison, uh, what about you? Well, all my colleagues have laid out what we're doing here in Minnesota. Uh, you know, worker safety is essential. An essential worker should not mean a disposable worker. And in southern Minnesota, we've had some really nasty breakouts. Also, central Minnesota, companies like JBS, abusers of people's uh, rights. Uh, this is one of the biggest beef chicken company, uh, you know, out of Brazil. Uh, this is a company with a horrible reputation of, uh, you know, uh, of bribery and, and, and market predatory behavior in the marketplace. And, and here they are now, um, basically uh, putting their profitability above the lives of, of workers that are working in those plants in places like Worthington and in central Minnesota. So we have been very aggressive, stepping up, holding them accountable, dealing with them, uh, defending those workers. That's been something that we're doing and we're going to keep doing. Also, you know, wage theft. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the midst of COVID, you would think that they'd be paying people right. We're, our wage theft unit is as busy as ever, busier than usual because people are trying to get away with stuff. And so that's been one thing. But I did want to mention also when it comes to this issue of prescription, drug prices, um, you know, one of the things that's going on now is that the federal government and state governments are putting money in to try to help companies come up with testing and vaccine. And these companies are using the, the public largesse that they've received to make these medicines and then charge the companies, uh, charge the uh, consumers at precipitous prices. Remdesivir, as a matter of fact, they say they're gonna retail that at three grand a pop but in other countries, they're not. So we're getting ready right now to deal with that. We issued a report, I hope y'all can see the title of this report, and we'll put it in the chat. Uh, it's called the, the uh, Report of Minnesota Attorney General's Advisory Task Force on Lowering Pharmaceutical Drug Prices. And so we're ready now to say that when test and vaccine hit the market, we're gonna be ready to make sure that those prices are fair and we are going to litigate on this issue. So this is something that we think is critical. And I know that all my colleagues are attuned to this as well. We will work together because we always do. And this is another issue that's coming up. So whether it's the price gouging, whether it's the online phishing scams, whether it's abusing workers, or whether it's scams they're trying to do and getting ready to do, we are at the ready to defend the public. And I'll also say we've spent a lot of hours uh, on the issue of housing. We've passed a moratorium on evictions. Still, we've had landlords saying, you're gonna get out, I don't care what the government says. Oh, you, we can't put you out, but we will turn off your utilities. And we've taken those people to court. And, we let, and we've taken so many of them to court that they know we're not messing around. Uh, you know, in fact, we've tried to vindicate the governor's authority to issue the emergency measures on now eight different lawsuits, and probably my colleagues have way more than that. Uh, but um, that, those has been a, that's been an ongoing thing, and we're going to continue to fight on behalf of the people of the state. Last point I want to make is some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle seem to be fighting for the right to spread COVID. They're literally fighting the governor as the governor of Minnesota is trying to protect people from COVID, 
They're trying to say, we're going to withhold your budget. We're going to fire your commissioners. We're going to do all kinds of stuff until you just widen open this, kick open the state so COVID can spread everywhere. We are confronting them. We're vindicating the authority of the governor. We're proud we are. And all four of us are proud of our colleague, Dana Nessel, who has been, boy, Dana's been fighting like a, like a tiger on this stuff, man. She, you all will remember who are watching this, that you had a bunch of folks showing up at the state capitol with guns uh, because the governor was trying to protect people from COVID. Well, Dana's fighting them back, and we're all proud of her. Oh, yeah. We're so, I mean, I wish we could have so many more uh, voices here, but as you can see, the, the role of the attorney general just expands to so many things. And I'm seeing in the chat, as soon as you said uh, that Republicans are trying to invite or entice COVID, we're seeing shout outs too. We need an attorney general in Texas and in Florida. Guys, we know and we need you guys to help us with that. Uh, so I do want to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about um, DACA and kind of what AG Becerra has been able to do out there in California and as a coalition. So AG Becerra, you led the fight to protect the DACA program from Trump's attempt to eliminate it entirely. Uh, in fact, because of the Dem AG coalition's early success in securing nationwide injunctions, I want to say that again for our audience here, but because of the Dem AG coalition's early success in securing nationwide injunctions, more than 600,000 Dreamers were able to renew their DACA status. And then you were successful at the Supreme Court where you uh, or successful at the Supreme Court. So can you uh, share why this fight is so important to you? Um, it is to me, uh, but it also appears that this administration is, it's intent on continuing their attack on dreamers. What steps comes next to preserve the DACA program? Sarah, this is a, this was a, for me, it was a very personal case, uh, being the son of immigrants. But more than that, because the Dreamers have been so courageous. Uh, their motto is undocumented and unafraid. And when you put yourself out there in the public and say, I don't have papers, you know what you're facing. And to still do that, you, you, there aren't too many people who are more courageous than them. And so there's no reason why we can't be as courageous and unafraid as they are. And so when we took on the case, and every one of us who's on this uh, chat was part of the effort because it was a nationwide effort by coalitions all around, not just AGs even, it was just a coalition all around. Uh, we, we had one goal in mind, and that is to let these kids who are American stay American. Uh, and so while most people thought it was an uphill battle, I remember after our team had come out of the Supreme Court uh, on the uh, argument, uh, I had a whole bunch of folks say to me, geez, that was tough. Um, you know, you gave it a, a college try. And I said, you know, don't give up hope on this. Don't give up hope. And I, at the end of the day, I, I believe the reason we won is because we believe in the rule of law. We believe that a government that put something out there for its people and has people rely on it to their detriment, doesn't just yank something away. You've got to go through a process, even an executive order, which isn't a law. Uh, maybe a, one president can establish an executive order and the next president can yank it away, but just you just can't yank it as if nothing was involved. And so that was the case we tried to make. And fortunately, uh, enough justices in the Supreme Court felt that same way. And now our fight continues because now we've got an administration that isn't willing to accept a Supreme Court uh, decision and is now trying to dismantle DACA through other means. And so we're going to do everything we can to make sure that this administration to its very last day, thank God, hopefully uh, we can all say January 19th will be its last day. Uh, we will make sure that the DACA uh, students, uh, all those dreamers continue to make that American dream a reality. And uh, thanks to everybody, not just the, my colleagues who are on this call, but uh, everybody who came to, to stand up for the dreamers who don't have the rights to stand up for themselves. Yeah, and I think this one is also super personal because I can't, uh, I'll be honest here, I cried when the decision was made. And so uh, hashtag here to say for all immigrants and for all our Latino communities were uh, at least for me, thank you, and to, to our AGs, um, really meaningful. Um, but to the AGs, I do want to 
uh, let's talk about ACA, um, the Affordable Care Act and what's happening there. So as you're all well aware, the Trump administration and 18 Republican AGs are asking the Supreme Court to strike down the entire Affordable Care Act, so calling the entire law unconstitutional. Uh, the coalition of Democratic AGs, which AG Becerra again has been leading, have fought back every step of the way. So can we discuss why this lawsuit is so critically important, especially during this unprecedented COVID pandemic? Um, so AG Weiser, I see you nodding a lot. So we'll start with you. Well, it was special because Javier, being the good man he is, and it, it says something about a team sport, literally the Friday before I took office, he said, Phil, join me on this conference call. We're announcing our uh, case that now ultimately is in the Supreme Court. And this gets to my background, which is in constitutional law. I want to first say back to the rule of law point that Javier said, it is surreal that we're litigating this case. The theory that the Justice Department has was basically just rejected in a Supreme Court case. It involves this idea of severability, which is you don't knock down a whole statute because a part of it might be unconstitutional. In the face of that principle, all these Republican attorneys general and the DOJ have basically said, we don't care. We are going to seek to end health care for millions of Americans. In Colorado, 400,000 people have health care because of the Medicaid expansion. And 700,000 people have protection from discrimination because of the protections from those who have pre-existing conditions who otherwise might get discriminated against. We're in a pandemic and this administration is still trying to take away healthcare, making what I think is a surreal argument. In the face of that, the Democratic AGs, and I wanna note two brave Republican AGs who are defending the rule of law are standing up for what's a core principle, which is laws get passed in this country, we expect them to be followed, including by the president and the administration. I believe, just like what Javier said, that principle will be vindicated next year, just like we vindicated the principle that we need a fair and constitutional census, just like we made clear that the dreamers have to be treated lawfully and fairly. And now it's about health care and the Affordable Care Act. We are seeing a testing of our institutions, a testing of the rule of law. That's why I often say the rule of law is on the ballot this fall, obviously in the race for president, but also in races for attorneys general, district attorney. We need to be a nation committed to the rule of law, just governance, and I'm so proud to work with these great leaders to do just that. So I do wanna open up the floor and so, um, I, either of the other AGs, if you want to, if one of you feels like you want to jump in first and, and, and continue off of what the great things AG Weiser said. Phil was uh, pretty good on that one. <laughs> He's got all the answers for us. No, it's a uh, it, during a pandemic, it's, I want to say that these, uh, we do have races coming up and we'll talk about it as we've kind of mentioned here, but we have Republican AGs who are consistently and will at no cost, not even during a pandemic, they're trying to take away healthcare from thousands across the, the country. And so pay attention to your, to uh, the elections and what's coming up. I, I see a lot of chatter here um, about who their, who the, their attorneys generals are. And so I'm glad you guys are paying attention, but Pay attention to what they're doing. Some of them are, of the Republican AGs are even under indictment. So um, take a look. But AG Healy or AG Becerra, did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I just add that these, you know, these are really important fights. And it's really frustrating when you see Republican governors and Republican AGs and states encouraging people not to wear masks. They're the same states where they have fought to take away health care from people. And now in the crisis that we're in, their numbers have only gone up because of their irresponsible action and resources that we've needed, frankly, um, uh, in the Northeast have now been diverted there, which you know, is appropriate on some level, but so unnecessary. So every day we battle these guys, every day it's about protecting people, standing up for people. Um, healthcare is a fundamental building block. Um, you know, and I just, I really, I, I, I can't uh, add to anything that, that either Phil or, or Javier said, um, except to underscore, I think for all of us, 
you know, we do these jobs because we understand the profound humanity, you know, in this work and the need to be there. And whether it's a bunch of us, you know, we were a bunch of us were down on the border um, two years ago, you know, as we were fighting family separation. And, you know, our very first action together as, as Democratic AGs was to take on the, the travel ban, the Muslim ban. And, you know, it's, it's been really proud. It's been, it's been great to hang with everybody through this. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, come November, we will see less action against the federal government, but um, we certainly have, have had our muscles tested and, you know, I think have, with a win rate, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, folks probably don't know this. We've won over 90% of our cases against the Trump administration in the courts, stopping bad things from happening, whether it was on rollbacks of environmental regulations or, you know, uh, consumer protection actions, you name it. And that, that's a record you know, to be proud of. Uh, Vera, I'll just add a couple of things. Remember the attacks on the Affordable Care Act aren't just the straight direct assault that now is before the Supreme Court. Uh, the Trump administration has been trying to uh, essentially pick apart the Affordable Care Act for the last three and a half years. They have tried to stop women from exercising their rights to reproductive care, and we fought them on that. They came up with a rule that said there should be religious exemptions for providers that could refuse to provide services, not just to women, by the way, it could be to an LGBT person, uh, LGBTQ person, if they don't like uh, the, the way they behave or uh, what their uh, status is. That, you can, you can, for almost any reason, so long as you say religiously, I don't want to provide this person services under the Trump proposed rule, they could have denied a woman, uh, LGBTQ uh, immigrant services. And so we fought that. Uh, we were successful most of the, in most of the cases to protect a woman's right to have access to services. They tried to come up with a rule that said that you had a split only for abortion care, the cost in your insurance plan uh, between all your other healthcare uh, services that you'd get and abortion. And so what they're trying to do is, even if, by the way, even if the, the charge for that additional plan for abortion services was one penny, you still had to have them segregated, which would mean that for a lot of people, they would fail to get the second plan or might forget one month to pay the plan and they'd lose it. So it was ridiculous what they were doing, but they've been attacking healthcare more than just the frontal assault on the Affordable Care Act. For the 133 million people who have a pre-existing medical condition, Donald Trump has said he's gonna protect you with, through an executive order. He doesn't need to do that. That's already protected under the Affordable Care Act. All he has to do is stop litigating in the Supreme Court to dismantle the entire Affordable Care Act. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very callous, devious, and harmful game that this administration has played in, in playing with the rule of law. And that's why we're standing up. Yeah, this is Keith here. I'll just dive in and say that everything my colleague said is spot on exactly right. But, you know, it's a good time to just remind everybody that, the, that yes, congressional races are important. Absolutely, we agree with that. And yes, the presidential is very important. But there's a whole bunch of other races that are absolutely essential to your quality of life and AG is one of them. So are district attorney races and prosecutor races. These are critical, and we need the Netroots Nation to plug in. I'll also say something that Javier mentioned that is not exactly on ACA, but it's related. And that is this doctrine, whereas historically the freedom of religion was that the state could not discriminate against you based on your religion. They are changing this doctrine to say that an individual business can discriminate against people because of who they are. Somehow it is a affront to Hobby Lobby to provide equal access to reproductive uh, health care for women. Or somehow, we got a case like this now, it's an affront to some, um, some videographer uh, to, to require that they serve the public equally uh, and that they will not be able to say that we're gonna deny services to a same-sex couple who wants to get married. They're literally using the doctrine of freedom of faith, freedom of religion, to discriminate against people. These people who call for a Muslim ban also want to say that a company can fire you because you're transgender, deny you service because you have a same-sex wedding, deny you, ser deny you uh, service healthcare because you want reproductive services. This is a critical fight for the public, and I'll say even by extension 
Yes, you need to be plugged into AG races, but we need to win the U.S. Senate because Trump is trying to load up the judiciary with the most outrageous right-wingers that you've ever seen. And just for scale, understand that Obama got about 95 people uh, in the federal judiciary. Trump has gotten nearly 200 in half the time. They are trying to blot out the rights of workers, civil rights through the judiciary. And who's your advocate there? Well, that's us. But it's also the judges who will tell the story. That's why these, these cases, I mean, these races are critical for your attention. That's why we need you to plug in that Roots Nation and help us win these races. Oh, thank you. I do want to make sure we make time for elections um, and then before we jump to questions. And so, folks, if you have questions, please uh, click on the Q&A um, at the bottom of the screen and, and feel free to ask there so we can we can get to it. But we've talked a lot about a lot of issues, but I do want to uh, talk about our 2020 elections. AGs actually have elections every year. And so turning to our 2020 election in just a few months, and what are we at, 82 days, 80-ish days, uh, we have 10 races this year where people will directly elect their state AG. Uh, we have tough, but really, really great opportunities to flip some red seats blue, such as Montana and Indiana. Uh, since all of you have campaigned before. What is one thing that you've learned while out on the trail that's important in AG campaigns and what makes for a great state AG? And so, uh, AG Healy. Um, look, I, you know, I, I think so much of it, it's a people business and you gotta be out there. Um, I, I don't listen to any polls. I'm not looking at the polls right now. Um, I don't believe much in polls. So, you know, for me, uh, prior to um, prior to law school, I, I had a basketball career, and um, you know my view is you always play like you're behind, and you play right right through the clock. And I think that's the mentality that we need to win these races. Take nothing for granted. We um, and also you know as I've learned in my state, people think of Massachusetts is very blue. Well, you know we had yes two million uh, Hillary voters, but we had, we had over a million Trump voters, you know? And I think within our states, you know, we, we recognize as state AGs that there are people, you know, um, uh, of all different parties, but there's a lot of commonality. If you find a way to connect with them, you can get the chance to make your case. And that's why I love being a state AG and being to, you know, able to be out there that way. But I'm just emphasizing that, you know, you can't do enough um, or, or work hard enough to, to win races and grassroots matter. I've learned endorsements, you know, now that I'm an elected, um, eh, you know, it's not to say candidates don't want endorsements, but it, it's the power of the people. And that's really what builds movements. And I think that's what ultimately wins elections. And that's why I'm so proud of uh, the Democratic Attorneys General Association really, you know, for bringing it the last few years that's brought in this amazing class of, of colleagues out there who are truly representative of, of, of the people and the communities that we serve. Sure, I'll Thank jump in. Um, let's see, AG Weiser, we flipped your state in 2018, so let's hear from you. Well, I, I wanna say that this group has been great about being a team and with real mentorship as well as former AG. So I will say something that I learned from Maura, also a first time candidate, it's really important to educate people about why AGs matter. So all of you who are on this Zoom call, you have a sense of why AGs matter. What an impactful position. Please spread the word, focus on these races. They should not be overlooked. So I use the phrase that I know more and others have used, which is we're the people's lawyer. We protect the civil rights, the consumer rights, equal rights. And that's something that I made clear throughout my campaign. Another thing, and predecessor here in Colorado, Ken Salazar, was a big fan of, I traveled to everywhere, every single county in my state, 64 counties. You show up and you listen. And you, just like Amora said, grassroots, you respect people. I don't care who you voted for for president. I don't care if you're gonna vote for me or not. If you're gonna show up, I respect you. I wanna listen to you. And you gotta keep showing up and building relationships because what has been said, it's so true. We are close to people. We are the people's lawyer, we show up, we listen. And this is something that teachers will tell you, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And by showing up and by caring about communities and working with them, 
you can build relationships, you can build trust. And right now we're living in a time with less trust in our public officials than ever before. And I'll tell you, one of our goals as state AGs is to build that trust, to show people that we're fighting for them. And I'm proud of how all the leaders on this call embody that spirit in a palpable way. Um, can I just mention quickly that a few years ago, the Democratic AGs were, had a halftime executive director. Now we have full and we have a much bigger, stronger team. We went from um, being housed, you know, um, out, you know, in, I think we were in Colorado to Washington. We, um, the fact is we have gotten very serious about electing Dem AGs. And uh, actually, quite frankly, the Republicans are kind of ahead of us. They, they, they were, they really geared up their operation before we did. And, you know, our message is that, look, Netroots Nation, just because somebody has better ideas doesn't mean they're going to win. We need you to help out and to pitch in and to make these races really competitive. You will lose 100% of the races that you're not in. So, and you don't never know, you never know that if you get in there and fight, you know, you can change the odds. Somebody might say in the beginning of your race, oh, that person has no chance to win. How do you know? You get in there, you fight, you start doing well, you get out there, you talk to a lot of people like Bill just got through saying, and you can change that race. So we need, we need folks to really start taking these races seriously because literally your lives depend upon it. If you look at how we've been defending um, people against the COVID disease, you, we're saving the lives of people. Our staffs are saving the lives of people. And so this is, these things are critical. I just wanna mention that, Bill, I couldn't agree with you more. This is a relationship business. Yes, we do mailers. Yes, we do TV and radio. But it is that person to person connection that people really feel. You cannot ask a TV ad a question. You cannot explain to a mailer how you felt when you couldn't afford your insulin. But if you show up and deal relationally, you can make a connection with people that will really, really go far beyond what you imagine. So I'll just say uh, thank you, Phil, for making that point and thank all of you for being right there. Or if I could just add, I'll just simply say, um, you know, this is 2020, not 1920. Uh, and but for the state AGs, it might look a lot more like 1920. And so, uh, we, in a way, we've been the backstop. I know people have said that before. The state AGs have served as the backstop to stop the Trump criminality. But I'll, I'll go a step further. I don't think we've just been the backstop. We've been the tip of the spear in defending what we know, but trying to push forward, even during the time of Trump, uh, uh, an agenda that says we can be forward leaning, even though we've got a backwards uh, administration. And so AGs have served a purpose, which I now think has become very evident to most Americans before you wouldn't have known. Uh, and I think more and more people are depending on AGs to come forward. I know that in California, we're being asked to do a lot more than we did before. And it's only because I think we've become very visible as an, uh, as an office. And uh, my sense is that Netroots Nation is a kind of team that understands what it means when sometimes you're taken for granted, but you get all the work done. And uh, I think the AGs, at least the Democratic AGs, feel like uh, for the longest time, AGs were taken for granted because people didn't really recognize what we did. But now that we see that we're in the 21st century and it's 2020, not 1920, I think more people are beginning to see that AGs have a role. And I hope you will help us make sure that there are other states who get to experience what our four states have experienced by having progressive, forward-leaning AGs at the helm. Mm -hmm. I thought our, our, my screen froze for a second, but thank you, AG. Uh, so I do, uh, thank goodness it's not 1920. And we're, if we're talking about building racial equity, I mean, we are far from that. But uh, so ha let's definitely elect more Democratic AGs. Uh, we've got some champions here on this panel here, but uh, 
uh, I do want to ask a question that came in um, from from the chat here. And so anybody, this opens up to anybody. So whoever wants to jump in on this one, but uh, we'll ask one question and then we'll we'll wrap up because great conversation, but we're almost at the at the hour. So can you speak to what AGs are? Um, are doing and can be doing on predatory lending. So for example, on rent a bank schemes when, where predatory lenders rent out bank charters to charge interest rates that exceed state uh, usury limits. Uh, as we know, these predatory loans drive black and brown communities deeper into poverty. So open it up to whoever would like to, to jump in first. Well, I'll just say that I think this is bread and butter work for all of our offices. Predatory lending, whether you're talking about payday lending, whether you're talking about mortgages and subprime mortgages, um, you know, or any number of other uh, financial instruments. So, you know, I think all of us have gone after and continue to go after those who are violating state usury laws, charging interest rates that they can't, that they're not legally allowed to charge. Uh, we go out, we run into court, we get injunctions, orders to shut them down. We also go out and try to grab the money back and get it back in the, the victim consumers uh, lenders pockets. Many of us have spent a lot of time on issues of subprime lending. You know, that started back in 2008, 2009, going after the big banks and investment banks um, for the role they played in the securitization of mortgages. You know, that work has continued in different forms over the last 10 years in all of our offices. Mm -hmm. We go after a lot of these shady predatory debt collectors, right? You've got mm -hmm. people who are out there just hounding people, violating the way you're allowed to collect de de uh, debt in our states. And finally, on student lending, you know, um, many of us have sued these student lenders who, you know, um, and these for-profit colleges who engage in predatory practices by targeting, you know, first in their families to go to college, veterans, people who qualify for federal loans, and then, you know, end up, um, taking all their money without providing them the education that they're entitled to. And, you know, that's another form of predatory lending, predatory practice that all of us have worked hard to do. In fact, some of us most recently were, uh, we, we sue the DeVos administration every other week, but we most recently got back uh, an order in court that required her to pay up on the actual, you know, predatory loans that were made to these students. Um, and it's an example of, I think, the important work that all of us are, are doing. And I know my colleagues have many more examples. Yeah. Let me jump I just in. say, yeah. if that's my last word, it's an honor to work with all of you and our colleagues in, across states. And I really think that Farah is right. I think Democratic AGs are the game. And as Javier says, they not only have been holding the line, but they have driven us forward. And you do not have a more progressive body of actors in government, period, anywhere in the country than the likes of Democratic AGs. So love the relationship with Netroots Nation. And I think together we can, we can get a lot done. Thank you, AG. I think AG Weiser, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, let me jump in and, and start with Maura's point, which is our role here is to defend people and protect people. And those who prey on people, whether it's big companies, Keith talked about the importance of antitrust. Um, Javier talked about fly-by-net operations that might try to take advantage of people and more are talking about predatory lending, we are here to protect people. Our government, as Abe Lincoln put it, is the government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's the spirit we need at a time which we're really facing a crisis of confidence in government. And we are, I believe, representing, tip of the spear is a good metaphor, of what good government, just governance looks like. On this issue about predatory lending in Colorado, we passed a 36% cap to end payday lending. For me, this is a religious issue. It was on the ballot when I was running. It passed overwhelming with 78% or so. That says something about people wanting protection. And so those who violate that are going to face our office coming down them hard for, again, trying to take advantage of the most vulnerable among us. We have another challenge on us, which is to help those who are unbanked, who are using check cashing services. We're out there fighting for people, and it's an honor to be doing this work. You know, I'll just say that, um, yeah, we do state, we do uh, enforcement regarding the uh, Fair Debt Collection Act, uh, payday lending statutes, consumer protection, uh, truth in advertising. This is what we do. This is the very guts. This is the blocking and tackling of our job. What I would say is that I, I worry sometimes that people who need our services don't know to call us. 
the Netroots Nation can help get the word out to folks who may need some help. A lot of times people are being abused and taken advantage of, and they're like, I don't know what to do. Well, call your state AG, particularly if it's them state AG who wants to fight for you. Um, you know, I left Congress, and how many of you left Congress? Because we wanted to be where the action is. That might surprise you. That might surprise you. You might think, well, I turn on the TV and all I hear about is Congress. Yeah, they're great and we love them. But look, as a congressman, if you were the victim of a payday lender, I would have to go call the state AG to help you. <laughs> now, I can just help you. So please, make use of your offices. Spread the word. Help us get more Dem AGs. And let's stop the predation of our economic livelihoods. As I said, I ran for this job to help people afford their lives and live with dignity and respect. Those two things, and I get to do it every day, and I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Thanks a lot, uh, Netroots Nation. Aaron, if I can just uh, say on that, um, it is bread and butter. And we, we're, we're, we sued Navient, the largest student loan servicer in the nation, uh, a few years back because they were clearly driving students into loan payment uh, repayment programs that were not good for them, but they were good for Navient. And so uh, we think it's important that these guys act the right way, just abide by the laws. And uh, if you're going to hold so people's money and their livelihood at stake, then you have an obligation to treat them properly. And so we're in court with, against Navient to try to prove that these guys were taking advantage of so many millions of uh, American college graduates uh, in the way they had to repay their loan. By the way, and it's not just Navient, all those for-profit colleges that are out there that are essentially marketing themselves and selling themselves. And then at the end of the day, they give you a piece of paper or a so-called diploma that's worthless. Uh, and they take advantage of you because they know, and by the way, they go after mostly people of color and, and low-income, first-generation college goers who don't have the experience with this, and they take advantage of the fact that you can apply for a federal student loan, and you run up your debt on those student loans. They don't care. They're getting the money. At the end of the day, you get nothing, and so we've gone after them, but let me tell you, let me close by saying this. The Trump administration, once again, is in this. California, and I suspect some of my colleague states also have laws that pro prohibit uh, Usur usurious rates in lending. Yet we have a law that doesn't allow that. The Trump administration is trying to pass a regulation that would allow uh, predators to evade that law by using a federal bank, which we don't have jurisdiction over because it, it's federal and we're state, use a federal bank to do their servicing, loan activity. It's called Rent-A-Bank. So they go out there and they go out there and they prey on you, but they do the loan through a bank, a federal bank. So guess what? They get to evade our state rules against usurious uh, interest rates. And the Trump administration is allowing this, is proposing rules that would allow this to occur to essentially let predatory lenders use banks, federally chartered banks, to go out there and prey on people. We're going to try to stop it. But once again, November is critical because we don't need a president who actually wants predatory lenders to get out there and use you as the next meal. And so we need you out there. We hope you'll get out there and we hope you'll support the AGs who are fighting the fight for you. Oh, it's so hard to follow all of you with your closing thoughts, but I do want to thank all of the panelists here, our AGs, and especially to our Netroots Nation. We need you guys this November. If you have a Democratic Attorney General, then pick a state that doesn't have one and get involved. And please visit our website at dems.ag uh, and take a look at the candidates that we have up this year. Get to know them. Get to know the work uh, that our amazing AGs here and others across the country have done. Uh, but also take a look at what we're doing next week during the convention. We're going to have some great panels there as well. So be sure to, to take a look at that. And we're so excited. Thank you so much for another great year, Netroots. And uh, excited to see you next year and hopefully soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.